I see quite a few folks joining us. So thank you again. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started today. Uh, thank you so much for joining. My name is Dea Zavala and I am the Executive Director of Mile High Connects. Um, I want to express a um, a, a heartfelt thank you for Dr. Cog for even offering to co-host this session alongside us. Uh, Mile High Connects, for those of you that don't know, is a regional coalition of community organizations, community organizers, nonprofits, folks from the philanthropic community and financial institutions that are working together to ensure a racially equitable and resilient Denver metro region where community solutions are really at the center of transformative systems change. And so we're happy to host this conversation today with a fantastic group of panelists um, that are really here to talk about environmental justice and transportation and helping us understand um, what's going on within community and ultimately how the work of Dr. Cog and the Regional Transportation Planning Initiative ultimately um, shows up within community. For those of you that are just joining us, um, I'm gonna ask that if you are not a panelist, if you could please turn off your camera, just so that we could see the beautiful shiny faces of our panelists on your screen. Um, but other than that, I wanna thank you. Um, as a heads up, we are recording this session because we have a number of folks that would love to participate but are unable to join us. So we will be making that available after the session as well. So. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Angelique Espinoza. She is with Good Business Colorado and our moderator for today's session. Angelique. Good morning, everyone. It's Thursday, Friday, Junior. I hope you all are doing well. <laughs> I'm very, very thrilled to be here and to moderate this important panel um, with a bunch of smart people um, with different perspectives on environmental justice and transportation in our region. Um, the Denver Regional Council of Governments has released a draft regional transportation plan for 2050, which I'm sure most of you know, and they're taking public comment and, um, and review right now. So there's also important work being done at the state and county, uh, city and county of Denver, as well as at the state legislature um, that will impact our climate goals and affect transit and mobility around the whole region. So, um, what I'm going to ask each of our panelists to do is, first of all, please introduce yourself briefly. Um, let us know uh, in a sentence or two what your organization does, um, and then answer the following question, and I'll repeat it if you need. From your vantage point, what practices have you seen work when it comes to centering and implementing equity and environmental justice at a community, local or regional level. So let's go ahead and start out with Christian. Uh, hello, my name is Christian Stewart. I am with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. I work with in the Office of Community and Business Engagement. I am the community connector for uh, Montbello, the far Northeast and uh, East Colfax. Um, and so that's a mouthful, uh, but that's who I am and who I work for. Um, and then I, to answer the question, could you, could you repeat the question just to make sure, I, I wanna make sure I answer it. Sure, from your vantage point, what have you seen work when it comes to centering and implementing equity and environmental justice at a community, local or regional level? Um, I think getting people involved in the conversation early uh, and keeping them engaged often, um, you know, and I know we have a, a lot of other questions on, on, on the on the, the panel, so I won't go too much into uh, to, uh, what I'm about to say, but, you know, one of the things that really have uh, resonated uh, with the community is, is compensation, is compensating our community for their expertise. Um, and that really is an equitable place, uh, especially since um, we know that a lot of our community, the, the people of color don't show up to these important conversations and making the barriers uh, a lot less um, is, is really important to make sure that they're engaging and they stay. Not only are we recruiting them to be in those conversations that we retain their, their expertise. Great, thank you so much, Christian. That is super important. 
Um, the next, uh, next we'll ask Janice to introduce herself and answer our question about um, implementing equity and environmental justice. Yeah, hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Janice Mackey. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Young Aspiring Americans for Social and Political Activism, or YASPA for short. Um, we work with particularly Black Indigenous students of color in Aurora and far Northeast Denver to cultivate them to be civically engaged in community and career. Um, I really love this question and completely agree that this could be a mouthful, so I'll keep it short. Um, but what I'll say is that reciprocity is a huge value of ours, um, particularly race grounded reciprocity. We have a manifesto coming out about that in partnership with other youth organizations, including um, Project Boys, Carter Youth Congress, um, and Solicia Lopez with Student Voice and Student Leadership um, in order to refute tokenism, right? So when we're thinking about equity and ensuring that folks are at the table, we wanna make sure we're not engaging in tokenism. And then also what really undergirds our work and kind of our orientation and what we've seen to work with regards to actualizing equity um, is indigenous ways of knowing. So um, if folks are familiar with Sandra Grande's work on red pedagogy, I can put it in the chat later. Um, she has some really great tenets and reminders of, you know, how we can orient ourselves so that equity happens. Um, she reminds us to push against normative traditional forms of what we deem as progress typically, which is typically only economical, um, honoring keeping our souls connected to the work, digging beneath the surface, um, and then also ensuring that we are not necessarily putting ourselves above you know, our environmental ecosystem as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Janice. That was a real call to authenticity today, I think. Um, next, we will go to um, Cindy and Sydney. Um, so you can, I guess, tag team. Um, well, would you just introduce yourselves briefly in your organization and address this issue of centering and implementing equity and environmental justice at the various levels? Sure. Um, I can go first. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Cindy Chang. I'm with Groundwork Denver. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I, Before I start, I wanted to recognize the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations and other indigenous people um, whose land we help steward today. Um, Groundwork Denver is an environmental justice organization focused in the Metro Denver area. Um, and our approach, I think, um, very uh, close to what we're talking about today is to be engaged and responsive to the needs of under-resourced neighborhoods and communities of color. Um, so when I think about your question about um, uh, centering equity and environmental justice, um, first thing that comes to mind is listening to the community, um, priori prioritizing their needs and daily lived experience, um, centering their voices in every conversation about their community, um, it seems really a simple um, concept, but uh, uh, seems to be challenging in implementation. Um, and I, I definitely want to echo Christian's um, sentiment about compensating folks for their time and, and for their efforts and um, their experience. Um, secondly, when we think about equity and environmental justice, um, we think it's important to recognize the role of historic systemic racism and structures that have built um, the environmental justice issues. Um, it, for example, redlining, underinvestment or disinvestment of public resources in these communities um, and uh, unequal decision-making powers that have uh, prioritized the needs of white privileged communities over others. Um, this has led to the inequities that affect um, not just wealth building and health of individuals and whole communities, but also um, to the inequity in the experience around climate change and climate impacts. Um, and then I, I would also just throw out, um, you know, when we when we talk about equity and climate change or equity and um, transportation and mobility, um, 
we we think a lot about how equity is not the same as equality. You know, when you talk about equality, everyone gets the same share or burden of something. Um, one of my colleagues calls it spreading the peanut butter around, um, especially in um, a sort of a regional um, effort like this. Um, but in equity, when we are centering the voices of who of those who've experienced injustice um, and we prioritize their needs, we actually end up um, uh, supporting everybody. You know, the, the phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, so when, you know, thinking specifically about transportation and transit, um, when you imp prioritize improving the transit service of um, folks who um, are in low-income communities or communities of color, you actually, end up ex improving the experience for everybody. Um, connecting bikes and pedestrian pathways or widening sidewalks, you're not only prioritizing improving the experience for people in wheelchairs, um, but you also um, you know, improve the experience for kids going to and from school, parents with strollers, and everybody who is using uh, those connections. Um, and same for air quality. So I'll stop there, but I'm super excited about this conversation and sort of where we go uh, from here. Thank you, Cindy. Sydney? Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sydney. I am the Community Research and Engagement Coordinator at Earthlinks, um, and that is in the Sun Valley neighborhood of Denver. We are a social enterprise nonprofit that journeys with folks whose lives have been touched by the trauma of homelessness um, through Earth Centered Programming. And so we really operate at the intersection of, of nature and, and houselessness. Um, but as a part of my role here, I research the intersection of climate change and homelessness. Um, and so I come to this conversation today with a lot of um, perspective in that sense. Um, but really when it comes to this question um, and, and preparing for it, um, uh, Janice and, and Christian and Cindy have already really hit it on the head and, and I had a few notes about um, and most importantly centering the voices of historically and presently marginalized groups um, and when it comes to transportation that's a lot of that's a lot of folks that's um, certainly our BIPOC community members our houseless um, community members um, community members of low income, um, community members with disabilities, um, but really how do we, how do we focus their voices and their presence at all levels of decision making um, and do so that disrupts this um, systemic um, tendency of, of paternalism and supremacy? Um, and how do we really combat that and um, lift the authority and importance of, of lived experience in that. Um, and then secondly, on a more practical note, um, just shifting the idea of, of cost and what cost uh, is and shifting it from a, you know short-term cost to long-term cost um, and shifting our perception of what might seem costly now um, in centering environmental justice um, for our marginalized um, groups will really, um, you know, pay out in, in the long term. So that's um, expanding transportation. It's, you know, exploring renewable and cleaner energy in our public transit. Um, it's thinking about our green spaces and our green canopy and, and where those places are and where they're not. Um, and so how do we shift our, how do we shift, um, our perception of costs and what's really going to benefit um, certainly everyone in the long term, but especially from an equity lens, our marginalized populations. Thank you. Sydney, thank you so much. Um, before we ask our other questions, I'm going to go ahead and throw it to Lisa and Alvin. Um, to frame up the plan that we're talking about today at a high level. Focus on what the plan is, what was looked at in terms of environmental justice, travel times and access, reliance of transit for low income folks, um, the definition of environmental justice. Just if you would frame up our discussion in terms of, of the 
Metro Vision um, Regional Transit Plan and help us understand um, what the discussions were inside that and what might be useful support in getting it to the finish line. So Lisa and Alvin. All right. Thanks, Angelique. Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Hood, and I am the Public Engagement Specialist at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog. Um, and I'm going to, Alvin and I have a couple of slides, and he's going to run through just kind of what Angelique said, just some, some background and some framing information and data about kind of the current transportation system that we're living in in the Denver region and, and what we're talking about with this 2050 plan. So hand it over to Alvin. Lisa. Hi, everyone. My name is Alvin Lila Sanchez. I'm a transportation planner here at Dr. Cog. And I've been telling Lisa, if we were in person, I'd love to have seen who here in the audience has even heard of Dr. Cog or been involved in our process. <laughs> I've only been here a year, so I'm seeing all new faces on this panel. But we're a regional organization. We span 10 counties, all are parts of 10 counties. So we include communities from our communities in the plains of Eastern Adams and Arapaho to our mountain towns in Clear Creek and Gilpin, and then all the different types of communities we have along I-25. So we're bringing a lot of different voices to the table and we're tackling issues related to quality of life that span our cities, our counties, and should be looked at it at a regional level. We're looking at transportation today, specifically one of our products, our regional transportation plan, but we also work on regional growth and development and we do some work with aging services and disability services. So helping folk throughout the region have access to opportunity and improve everyone's quality of life. In terms of our regional transportation plan, um, we've been working on this for about a year and a half, so we're finally at the, the draft plan stage. Um, we do an update like this every four years, and we look at all different modes that you've heard mentioned here so far on the call. Um, everyone thinks of our roadway network and our transit system, but we're also looking at our bicycle facilities, our bike lanes, our sidewalks, our regional trails, we're looking at how the system operates. So thinking of our snowstorm a couple of weeks ago, how does that system keep working for people and keep working for everyone? And then we also look at the impacts of our system on users. So what does safety look like today? What do we want it to look like by 2050? How are freight and goods movement looking today? How do we want to look in the future, especially with the pandemic, looking at all the package delivery, grocery delivery we've been having, how do we keep people's quality of life well throughout shocks to the system? In terms of the discussion we're having today, uh, when it comes to environmental justice, we look at two specific areas. There's the meaningful involvement of folk in our process. We've taken some steps in this plan to get more people involved in our process that we haven't historically involved. But then we also want to make sure that the investments we're looking at, the priorities we're developing, and what we're looking at in the future isn't disproportionately burdening any particular community, recognizing that communities across the region and specific communities have borne that burden disproportionately in the past. If you were to open up our plan, uh, we have the main plan and then an appendix, but we look at a lot of different groups in the, in the region. Uh, there's communities of color and then low-income communities, but then we also broadened our analysis for this plan to look at our, our older Americans, so those over 65, young Americans, so five to 17, people with no access to a vehicle, speak, people who speak limited English, and then folk with disabilities. So we've uh, broadened our analysis for this plan just to see what uh, what our investments are having an impact on those communities. We also, as part of our plan, just look at what are the current conditions. So across our income levels and across the different communities, driving alone is still the way most people get to work. But we also want to recognize that my uh, communities of color and low-income communities are more likely to take transit to work. That's about 5% compared to other communities. Um, in terms of driving alone, you can see there's a drop-off in terms of income. So folk who make a pretty good income just switch to teleworking at a certain point and aren't actually taking their work trips. Like I mentioned, even looking at different communities in terms of race or ethnicity, uh, most folk drive, but we do want to recognize that a disproportionate share take transit or walk and bike for their trips. So like I mentioned, most folk are driving alone in the region but we do wanna take into account that share that is taking transit, making sure that the investments that we're using, like was already mentioned, if we're helping a certain group of the community, we're helping everyone. If we're creating a high quality transit network that works for our low-income communities, our communities of color, it works for everyone else in the region. 
uh, like I mentioned, communities of color are more likely to take twice as likely to take transit or even carpool. So taking some form of shared transit. And then like I'd already mentioned, there's a increasing teleworking as you get higher up in your income. A key part of our analysis is looking at the way people can get to work and that's through transit. And if it's good access to transit, not just do you have a bus that's in front of you, but does do you get there in a good amount of time? And is it quality transit that gets you to your work? Uh, we think with our plans investments that in terms of what we call our environmental justice areas, which are low income or communities of color, 78% of those communities have good access to jobs through transit, looking at uh, areas with high concentrations of low income communities or communities of color. Uh, in general, from where we are today and where we're looking at in 2050, uh, in terms of travel times, people driving will take a little longer, but it's a smaller increase for our low income communities and communities of color. As part of our analysis, based on what we heard from a couple of our advisor groups, we actually expanded what we look at. So uh, in terms of what we modeled, we looked at grocery stores, colleges, and hospitals. That wasn't something we had done in our previous analysis that might feel like, a, of course, you should be looking at that, but oftentimes in this work, it's like, you just need to say it and then someone thinks that it's a great idea, we should do it. So that's part of what we've done with our modeling is expanded. What are we looking at and what are we measuring? Because folks don't just go to work and then go home. They have to live their lives and run errands, groceries, have healthcare. So that was a part of our expanded access. And we think uh, for the region overall, but for our low income and communities of color, there's increased access and closer access to those amenities. And then in general, um, I'm sure as everyone on this panel knows, communities of color and low-income communities are pretty centrally located in the region, uh, some pockets to the east and even low income in our rural areas, but in general, close to, close to our regional center. And then uh, just one last point, our communities of color generally have longer travel times than our low-income communities. And then I believe that was last slide, right, Lisa? So she's actually gonna then tackle some of the steps we're taking to improve equity. Yeah, so those, those are really the only slides you're gonna see today. Um, we just wanted to frame the discussion with a little bit of the data and the analysis that was done in the plan because um, I think it's important to look at both our current transportation system and also what's planned in this 2050 plan and where we're going to get to. Um, and then really just kind of explain Dr. Cog's role in analyzing environmental justice and equity impacts based on the plan. Um, but it, when it comes to that question, um, what practices have you seen work? I think that, um, you know, we have kind of a unique perspective from Dr. Cog because we work at this regional scale. And so a lot of environmental justice and equity work really does happen at that community level. So we, we're, what we're trying to do is to connect from both that you know, that big regional scale down to the community level um, and really engage with people that have been underrepresented in the transportation planning decision-making process. I think in the Denver region, we're really living with, and some of the other panelists have already said that, we're living in, with the decisions that were made inequitably decades ago. Um, and those are consequences that we all are dealing with now. And I think that there's an important role to play from the regional perspective of trying to kind of undo the harm that was done, um, obviously not create any additional harm. Um, and a big part of that is having, like our other panelists have said, is having more voices in the process. Um, so we've really focused in the regional transportation plan. We've put a lot of intention and thought into how do we engage um, all people in the region, especially those that have not usually had their voice heard in transportation decisions, um, in talking about what their transportation future should look like. Um, so we, some of the things that have worked, you know, we've been working on for the last two years. Um, and I think kind of things that you hear, um, you know, going out to where people are, I think that worked really well. We did that in the um, initial phase of the plan where we went out and went to a bunch of fairs and festivals back when we were able to see people in person. Um, it was absolutely one of my favorite things that I've done. We went to like Colorado Black Arts Festival, Westminster Latino Festival, a bunch of county fairs, Colorado Open Streets. We were just out all summer talking to people about their transportation vision. And that's, we were really hearing from people that aren't the typical people that are maybe on like a Dr. Cog mailing list about um, transportation planning. And I think that that really helped us get a bigger picture about what people want from their transportation system. And so Dr. Cog has tried to incorporate that throughout the, the rest of the transportation um, planning process. And another thing that we 
um, we did that I think uh, has been really useful in helping develop the plan is that we convened two advisory groups. Um, so the first was a youth advisory panel um, where we focused, we brought together um, teenagers that were actually all on their youth advisory commissions for their local governments and talked to them and they helped us shape the plan throughout this whole um, last year and a half or so. And then we also convened a civic advisory group and that was where we really focused on trying to bring in voices um, from those populations that we haven't heard from before. So people that haven't been engaged in the transportation process before. And so they've kind of stepped us through this whole plan and provided input throughout. Um, and I think that kind of early and often engagement where people have a chance to um, make a difference really from the beginning of the plan. And it's not just at the end kind of looking back at the draft, um, but really engaging and helping that development. So. Uh, we've talked a lot, so I'm going to get back to our other panelists, but um, thanks for the opportunity and thank you so much for everybody for attending this meeting today. Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to go to some specific questions for our panelists and uh, just so that we have some time at the end to answer questions from our attendees. Let's try and keep these answers short, maybe three three, four minutes, maybe on the three side. Um, and I'm going to start again with Christian. Um, Christian, environmental justice encompasses a wide range of topics from climate impacts to housing to transportation. What practices or major improvements have you seen when it comes to making strides towards equity in transportation? Awesome. So I wrote my answers down because I tend to go off cuff and I don't want to do that. So I want to be as concise as possible. So please forgive me if I sound robotic. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm uh, answering the question. So uh, so what I have is uh, one, so a few of the things um, that I've seen uh, is that, you know, identifying and streamlining the projects coming into our equity areas. And when I say projects, I'm speaking from the Department of Transportation infrastructure. Um, uh, projects and then getting all the project managers on one page when it comes to outreach and limiting the touches in outreach and this limits outreach fatigue which a lot of us have and, and are experiencing another way we have been approaching outreach is bringing engineers planners designers to the streets uh, we utilize walking groups and walking tours to engage with the community and this brings a more equitable approach to their work by being in the neighborhoods they are working on and giving face um, to the communities to interact with um, and so that that's one thing and another was the creating a budget to compensate for community expertise one of the things that we have noticed is that um, we have consultants um, who are getting paid to do outreach. And so we're paying them to go to the community to ask the community for outreach. And then, then they're delivering it to us. And so, you know, it just seems to be unfair that we are not creating the same value in the community um, expertise that we're asking for. Uh, and, and what is really going to create a more equitable process and bring in more people and keep more people at the table. And so we have uh, been, and you know, a few, it's not every project, but a few projects making sure that we are, you know, having some budget to like, hey, here's a $50 grocery card, you know, more so even moving towards the actual uh, money or cash. And so uh, those are just a few things and I'll be quiet here. Thank you so much. It's like they say, follow the money, right? Then you find out what your priorities are. Um, the next question is for Dr. Janice. Um, and it is around youth, of course, uh, an important voice that will be most impacted by climate change are youth. YASPA has done a tremendous job advocating for youth fairs and transit options in the recent past. And I'm wondering, what are you hearing from your community as the biggest concern when it comes to climate? And what are you seeing as opportunities in our region to better engage youth in this dialogue? Yeah, thanks for the question and ditto to Christian, I wrote mine too. <laughs> so thanks for naming that so I can stay on track too. Um, shout out to you all, um, Mile High Connects for your work and partnership um, Together Colorado, 9 to 5 Colorado, 
um, Matthew from Donnell K and RTD board member Chantel Lewis on that collective work you're speaking about with regards to reducing the fares. Um, what was really unique about that, I think, is that Colorado is such a local control state and we had to actually be really strategic about putting weight, if you will, on this regional RTD board by engaging in local community organizing. Um, so that's something I just want to bring to light because it's like a civic literacy moment, right, that I think we should all kind of understand and like think about when we think about the 2050 plan. Um, our youth had launched a transit equity campaign actually in 2020 <laughs> before COVID um, to increase transit access, um, specifically for college classes, otherwise known as concurrent enrollment, right, because an opportunity is not an opportunity um, if you don't have access to it, right. Um, that campaign is on hold right now due to COVID, but we know it's something that's going to resurface again um, in order to actualize racial equity in that space concerning college access. We also know that um, Community College of Aurora students as well, and getting between the two campuses, Center Tech and Lowry, um, have had issues as well. And so that's something that we see continuing to persist that will need to be mitigated and addressed. Um, I was also happy to see that the Youth Advisory Council um, that you all had put together for the 2050 plan um, talked about transit access and jobs as a top priority, um, specifically as a measure for success. Um, because we know due to gentrification that there's many families moving out to the burbs <laughs> and transportation is not sufficient um, in these spaces. And you need still access to extracurricular activities, to sports, to get to work. Um, and we know even during COVID too, the activity buses were not offered for students too. So transportation issues are still happening. And then also as an organization that's kind of a social science incubator um, and really cares about youth being civically engaged through a career, um, we were really excited to hear that there's interest um, from the Youth Council as well with regards to connecting and bridging youth to kind of the career sector of transportation as well. Um, lastly, um, with regards to, you know, opportunities to engage youth, I would say, um, first, as I spoke of earlier, reciprocity is very important. Um, and I'm bringing that to light again, because that is indicative of a interwoven, um, enduring, ongoing relationship, rather than kind of the last minute, you know, like, hey, we want to engage youth, right? We checked a box. Thank you for your time, um, which perpetuates tokenization. So, that's something to be mindful of. Um, what we hear from youth as well is they want feedback. Like, how did y'all use our wisdom, <laughs> right? Um, oftentimes that feedback loop is missing. So they share their wisdom. Like, you know, Christian was indicating that community wisdom is shared. And then we don't find out how it actually translated into policy. Um, because oftentimes it may or may not be translated into policy, but they, there's no feedback as to how that happened or didn't happen. Um, and then lastly, as well, I would really push for um, work-based learning opportunities, internships and apprenticeship models that are paid, right, um, in this space as well um, to bridge folks into the transportation space. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I know that some of us may have experienced tokenism in the past, and it's a very frustrating experience that we would not want to subject our youth to anymore. <laughs> Um, okay, so now I have a question. Again, it's for both Cindy, Cindy and Sydney. I think you did that on purpose. <laughs> um, and this is around Denver's environmental justice approach. So mobility and land use are especially connected when we think about climate. Sprawl leads to single, um, single vehicles on the road and low income folks are left behind as transit operates on COVID scheduling. You know, a lot of routes have been dropped. Um, the connections between health and climate are more prominent now than they ever have been in terms of, I think, overall awareness. Um, coronavirus and climate change are gonna both require us to think differently. So what changes to the Denver region's transportation system could have the most immediate benefits on our communities? Maybe Cindy, you could address that first. Sure, I'm happy to, and I will try to stick with your timeline here. Um, so Gr Groundwork Denver has been working on climate justice um, for many years now, 
And um, what our work has shown us is um, what you were speaking to, sort of the accumulation of decades of environmental injustice, you know, as far back in Metro Denver history, including 1930s redlining, um, major transportation infrastructure, such as I-70 and I-25 in the 50s, um, those compounded with the lack of investment of neighborhood infrastructures means that some of our neighborhoods, um, our environmental justice neighborhoods have fewer trees and open space. Um, they lack stormwater infrastructure to uh, drain all that water from all those impermeable surfaces. Um, they incre you know, increase land surface temperature, reduce uh, local air quality. So, um, you know, obviously these issues are not new and our communities have been dealing with these climate impacts for a long time now. Um, we add a global pandemic on top of that. Um, folks from these neighborhoods are our frontline and essential workers. Um, they're working at those grocery stores. They are uh, cleaning and sanitizing our hospitals and our buildings. Um, and on top of that, worrying about, um, you know, getting evicted or, um, uh, you know, having to take two buses to work, those kind of things. Um, you know, the, the issues of environmental justice are complex and they're deep. Um, and so our solutions have to be complex and deep as well. Um, I think about um, making equity decisions around transportation that pr prioritize access to public transportation and biking and walking infrastructure. So not the car piece um, and lifting that tide uh, for everybody. Um, secondly, working in neighborhoods and municipalities to address the past disinvestment. Um, you know, things like planting trees, removing excess pavement, um, increasing green infrastructure to really address those, um, those climate impacts today. Um, and then, you know, working with community organi organizations, as Lisa was talking about, really to address uh, land use in conjunction with transportation, you know, promoting high density, mixed use, affordable housing development in their communities, not out in the in the suburbs um, and working proactively to prevent displacement um, because of the green improvements that we're making. Um, so just a few thoughts there. Thank you. Sydney, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Cindy really hit, it, hit the nail on the head there, but um, I'll just add a few more things um, and quickly I wrote down notes but um, I will try to just um, maybe come at it from that health and climate um, perspective and from my research at Earthlinks um, at this intersection of climate change and homelessness and the conversations that I've had with participants on their lived experience transportation has certainly been one of the main themes in those conversations um, and transportation has a lot to do with, with the health of our community. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is um, the presence of smog and smoke in our, in our communities and our air quality. Um, we're certainly no stranger to a smoggy day in Denver, um, and that is caused by fossil fuel consumption um, and certainly also wildfires. Um, and so how do we and I'll add that our houseless population um, is more prone to respiratory illnesses in general, and they're also more likely to be outside on days like that. Um, and from a racial equity lens, um, our communities of color are disproportionately affected by both houselessness and environmental degradation. Um, and so how do we, how do we make transportation um, first more equitable and accessible, but also appealing for everyone to use so we can cut down on um, fossil fuel consumption that ultimately leads to um, contributing to those smoggy days and the health of our community across the board, but certainly in our houseless community members who also don't have um, a lot of access to adequate health care. Um, COVID on top of that makes it certainly um, harder to exist uh, in the city, especially um, adding another thing that attacks the lungs to, um, to the mix. Um, and that on top of decreasing bus schedules and the frequency of run routes, um, crowded buses are also, have also been a huge 
topic of conversation um, with my participants and their anxiety around, you know, having to get places and also having to expose themselves in these ways. Um, and for some, that's the only way they, they can get around um, almost all. Um, and so how do we how do we protect our communities in that way? Um, and then the last thing I'll add, Cindy touched on this as well, but how do we um, have more consideration for the impervious surfaces that we are adding to our communities or already have? Um, and how do we start to expand green spaces and green canopy in neighborhoods that um, have a lot of these surfaces, which um, are directly correlated with low-income neighborhoods, communities of color, um, and that certainly is a health issue as well. Extreme temperatures are, are very dangerous, um, and so how do, we, how do we start to prioritize that? Um, I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that really introduces a human, a very human element, I think, to the conversation. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to do have a last question for me <laughs> before we go to our audience questions. Uh, and again, if we could just be pithy, that would be fantastic. Um, good job this round. And so this is a question to all of our panelists, and that also includes our Denver Regional Council of Governments folk, uh, Lisa and Alvin. Uh, so again, we'll start with Christian. You're always top of the top of the uh, of the roster. <laughs> What does success look like? And what role does equitable transportation play on issues like housing and climate? Um, what are the opportunities to integrate equity considerations in transportation planning at a regional scale? Sorry, that's like three questions, but I'm hoping you can touch them all. That's why I wrote it down. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna set the stage. So. <clears throat> Equitable transportation, uh, you know, is identifying costs and routes uh, that support the economic mobility of communities that are marginalized, you know, and so equitable transportation connects opportunities um, with decreasing our carbon footprint. Transportation, cars, um, actually are debt traps that entangle the user with maintenance costs, gas costs, DMV charges and fees, along with the reality of being racially profiled. Uh, so, you know, we never want to forget also the negative impact on environment. So success um, oh, on, on environment for the poorest of us. Uh, and so success looks like creating infrastructure to support a multitude of transit options. Success is also making sure that transportation is accessible in multiple languages through signs and phone apps. Um, this also means hiring transit operators who speak multiple languages. Success looks like less oil spills from cars. Success means connecting to neighbors on the bus, train, or shared rides. Success looks like creating travel plans for residents of housing authorities and senior living facilities. Success looks like electric vehicles spanning the region. Opportunities to integrate equity in transportation can mean having a person, social worker, therapist, uh, be present on mass transit to make riders aware of services and resources in the area. And that's my answer. Thank you. That was great. Um, so Dr. Janice, would you like me to repeat the question or you got it in your head? I think I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and what a dignifying experience. I just love what was just said. Thank you for that, Christian. Um, so I'll answer it in two ways. I want to reference um, Kansas City, who provides free transportation, right? So I just want to say that, like, how about free? <laughs> um, it is possible. Um, they indicated that the eight to nine million, you know, that they were getting from those fares anyway could have been easily recouped elsewhere. Um, so I just want to throw that out there, that I think it would be, you know, absolutely fantastic um, if transit was free. Um, particularly for our young people. Um, I also want to bring in the element two of, you know, those who are experiencing mental health challenges. Um, so I really appreciated what you were sharing, Sydney. My uncle has schizophrenia and he gets a bus pass, which is meaningless, to be honest with you, right? Because it's hard for him to keep up with. Um, and so it should be free, right? So that, you know, these false barriers that are in place are no longer barriers. Um, so that he's able to enjoy the sun and get on the bus and get to where he would like to go without 
having to remember while navigating a mental health challenge and a chronic illness of remembering his where his bus passes, right? Um, and so I think we really have to be cognizant of the ways and sometimes we think of equity, but we create barriers to that equity that we're supposedly trying to envision and actualize. And I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's go to Cindy. Um, sure. Um, yeah, six, what does success look like? Um, you know, I, I have this vision of abundable, abundant, affordable housing uh, located near transportation infrastructure um, that makes options other than driving convenient, safe, and affordable um, or free. I love that option. <laughs> um, you know, cl clean air, reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and safety, you know, no traffic fatalities or injuries. Um, again, complex and deep solutions to complex and deep challenges. Um, you know, when, when our most vulnerable, our kids and our, and our elders um, can be out there safely and conveniently by walking, biking, or busing, you know, that's what I see as success um, in mobility and in transportation in our region. Um, and, uh, you know, I, want, I wanted to also um, highlight what Dr. Mackey was saying around, um, you know, bringing the feedback loop back. Uh, you know, I don't, I love that Dr. Cog has um, had so much outreach and um, has created these advisory groups and, and um, I would love to see a structure in which that continues beyond the planning um, stages so that, that that feedback loop is closed. Um, that the community hears what you did with the data and um, that you heard them and that you respect them and um, you've moved along their priorities. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's a continual assessment around um, the impact of projects on housing gentrification and climate and whose voices are at the table. Great. Um, Sydney. Yeah, thank you. Um, gosh, I I was also going to shout out Kansas City. I'm born and raised Kansas City, and I'm so proud of them. Um, there's a lot to be done there, but it's a great example. Why not free, like Dr. Dr. Mackey said? Um, and you know, adding on to that, in my conversations with participants and in my work, transportation is one of the largest costs, even with the Live program, even with the um, discount program. Um, there are still like very major barriers to access um, in our transportation system. Um, and so how do we challenge this like lack mindset of needing to um, charge for this service? And, and how does that um, shift to that um, idea, perception of shifting, perception of costs and like the long-term benefit of making public transportation free for our community? Um, so yes, I wanna echo that. Um, and I'll just say that transportation justice, housing justice and environmental justice are all in interconnected and we have to have all of them in order to be doing equitable work. Um, and the final thing I'll say is um, just a note on, um, Dr. Mackey said this earlier, an opportunity isn't an opportunity unless you have access. And so, expanding expanding routes to communities that need it, um, expanding access, because a lot of my participants are, are, you know, it's hard to get healthy food. It's hard to get a stable job. It's hard to, um, you know, take a housing opportunity if they can't get anywhere. Um, and so this is really an integral part in opening a lot of doors um, and, and we have to treat it as such. So I'll stop there, yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Lisa. All right. Yeah, so unpacking this question, I think from my perspective, because I, you know, Alvin kind of focuses on the transportation planning side, I focus on the public engagement side. So I'll kind of speak to the public engagement stuff and he can speak to the, the planning stuff. But um, 
my idea of success uh, is that people have, everyone has a chance to have their voice heard and they feel heard. So I really liked the discussion about reciprocity and also that feedback loop. I think that that's something that Dr. Cog is really working to do rather than just asking for input and then you'll never hear from us again. Um, really trying to come back around and tell people how we use their input, how it influenced the decisions. And I think the advisory groups that I mentioned, we had our our youth advisory panel last night, and one of I think the last thing they said was they were so grateful that um, they could really tell that they had made an impact throughout the plan. And so that was really important to me. And I think that that's really how we are going to make change. Um, I think kind of going back to Dr. Cog having this unique role regionally, I think that um, we're a really good place for collaboration and really setting the stage to talk about these complex and deep issues. That's that's really the point of Dr. Cog is for all of the local governments who all have their own issues, but these issues really, especially like transportation and housing and climate, they all extend beyond a certain municipal boundary. So you have to think about these things from that bigger scale before you get down into the, you know, the community action and the local actions that need to happen um, to make the difference. So I think that from my perspective, I really want to get the public engagement part right from the regional scale, you know, planning out for the next 30 years, if we can get it right from the beginning, um, then all of those complex and deep steps that we need to take to address those, those problems, I think will, will be better. Um, and I just think that all of these issues are so interconnected. All of the panelists have brought up such, such great things. Um, but I think that in all, I mean, transportation, equitable transportation should benefit the lives of all people, um, and including those who need it most. And so I think that that really is the, the key for what success is. All right. Um, Alvin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, at the risk of just repeating what a lot of the panelists have said, I think I would just focus on like what success would look like as choices, like now and in the future, being able to not have to take a single occupancy vehicle for a trip. We have a great opportunity the region. Almost 20% of our trips are short trips. They're less than a mile. So why do we need to take a car for that trip? How can we do it safely as well if we're walking, biking, and rolling? We know just from current conditions, I'm sure our panelists know that Folk who are biking, walking, rolling make up a disproportionate number of fatal crashes on our streets. So not just giving those choices to people, but making them safe and convenient and accessible for, for all users. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to ask some questions that we received from our attendees now. Um, and first, I'm going to collapse a couple of questions together. Uh, so uh, one attendee asks, um, in response to Governor Polis and other immunities who seem to be very focused on the shiny train, um, which serve fewer people than buses like the 15 and 15L serve, um, you know, how can we um, shift the conversation from rail to what we know is good transit, fast, reliable buses? Who wants to jump in on that one? I don't know if I have an answer, um, but I do see the difference, right? And I, I see, I've, I've written the, both the rail and the buses. I actually live in East Colfax. And so I see that there is, uh, you know, there is not the same amenities on, on the buses. There's not the same, you know, attention, right? The, the, the light rail potentially, and I don't know this, you know, maybe the riders, uh, maybe they encompass a, a, a higher median of income uh, than the other, the buses that we're talking about. And that's maybe why the prioritization goes there. Um, I don't know how we shift that uh, unless we shift the values of our culture to not, you know, it's not everybody, you know, deserves transportation, right? And so, I, I, I'm going to pause here. I know I didn't answer, uh, but I think that's such a complex thing that really drives at our values as a society. I can, I can jump in there as well. Um, as a 15 and 15L vet, um, <laughs> I can say that those are our busiest buses. Um, and, and also the 16. I've I, I ride all three of them. Um, and 
I just think, yeah, it, it's it's absolutely. I think Christian, you're you're right. It's absolutely a a, a testament to our values as a community, um, and that's something that needs to be said. And um, I'm, gosh, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> but um, I think it's it's a it's a call for a shift and and a realization that when we lift our um, folks that you know, need our public transit the most and are and most like utilizing. I've never seen a train as packed as our, our 15L. Um, and so how do we start to prioritize folks that really need need this and, and use it um, instead of, you know, what's shiny or what's, <laughs> what's um, maybe, and maybe the people on the train are bringing in more income, but is that what we need to prioritize? Um, and so, just adding a little bit in there, but I'll, I'll stop right away. I'm gonna jump in and see if anyone wants to focus on the how about free part uh, of that of the question, because that is a, some, a, a theme we really heard echoed by our attendees as well. Um, how, how do we, maybe we help to, to shift the conversation by recognizing how, um, how inherent bias works in our prioritizing of trains over buses. So that's kind of what I heard there. Um, and then, so what about free? What, what are your thoughts on how we might be able to get there? Or at least shift the conversation so that it's something that's being realistically considered. I actually just wanted to jump in first on that previous question and we can also kind of handle free, free fares. Um, part of what our regional plan does is set that vision for the future. So we've taken like RTD's most recent uh, BRT feasibility study, and we're trying to implement that through our plan. So that's high quality transit where the people are on major corridors. corridors. So you're looking at BRT on federal, on Colfax. Um, we have, I think, 10 routes. Uh, if these were all implemented, there'd be, I believe, 146 new miles of BRT in the region. So I think part of what we do is just what are the, what's the vision we're putting in our plans? What are we showing as our investment priorities? Obviously, we do want to finish fast tracks, and a key part of fast tracks is also just quality bus service as well as those rail components. And then, uh, in terms of free free fares, um, earlier on in our planning process, we did some scenario testing. Uh, we built scenarios off of what we heard from the public and they wanted quality transit, more choices to be able to bike, walk and roll through the region. So one of those scenarios was actually a transit scenario that looked at free fares. So I think part of that is just starting to explore that in our own planning processes and showing what those findings are for all of our, our member governments, the people of the community, and just being able to show those results. So I, I mean, coming from the planning side results and what are those findings? Anybody else want to jump in on the, how about free? All right. I, I do want to jump in just as a reminder that again, it's not going to be an opportunity if we create barriers around it. <laughs> so just bringing my uncle into the equation again, right? It's free for him, right? But there's still a barrier in place um, around documentation. So let's be mindful of it's one thing to have it codified, right? But the implementation side of things with policy is always so much of where the hiccups come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, like um, what use is a free food bank if you don't know where it's located? You know, like <laughs> so. But 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 with the free thing, I I I want to I support it, but I I want to caution the idea because of the sustainability of it, right? And so I do think free should be like for people under 18 or under a certain um, income limit, but I don't know how sustainable for free for everyone, right? And I do think the ones who can pay are more likely to pay, right? They, they wanna buy into this, right? If they can, if they, can they, they support it. So I, I, I don't know, from an economic standpoint, I don't know how sustainable free for everybody is. All right, I guess we'll, we'll end on um, the question without knowing exactly what the answers might be, but that's what we're here to do, right? To have a community conversation about it. 
Um, okay, so I'd like to move on to another question that our that our audience um, submitted. What solutions are being um, explored? This, I think, I want to throw this especially to our um, Denver Regional Council of Government folks. Uh, I keep spelling that out because when I first started on Boulder City Council, uh, where I served for a couple of years, you know, everyone said Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog, and I was like, Who's this Dr. Cog? <laughs> and, and then I, then I understood the acronym. Um, so. For you folks especially, what solutions are being explored to mitigate air pollution due to expanded highways? Oh, and also if everyone could just preface their questions, their answers briefly with um, whether or not you ride public transit. I'll start. Um, before the pandemic, uh, I took public transit about half to get to work. Um, otherwise, I just walked to get to work. Um, I'm close enough that I have that opportunity. Uh, in terms of what we're doing to mitigate air quality or pollution, uh, something we did most with this plan, especially compared to last plan, is just highlighting and putting in projects that we wouldn't have before. So safety projects, uh, transit projects like BRT, active transportation projects. Um, we don't have we don't specifically find like air quality projects because a transit project will improve air quality if it's getting folk out of their cars and onto a bus um, or you're switching trips from a quick trip on a car you're walking or biking instead um, when we do look at road widenings or like on our freeways or our roads um, we've it's dr cog staff's intent that those roads are multimodal so there's bike options uh walking options they're connecting to a larger network and they're not just these um standalone facilities and they provide those first and last mile connections to actually make it an accessible connected network. Uh, in terms of what some of those widenings, I would like to give credit just to CDOT that a lot of most, if not all of their freeway projects are managed lane projects. So those could also serve BRT, future BRT or current BRT on those systems. So there is uh, some mitigation in terms of, we're not just adding free lanes anymore in the region there are being paid for, and we're attempting to shift some trips from cars. Yeah, and I can add on to that. Um, I will start by saying that I am a devoted light rail uh, rider and bus rider. Um, I've been working from home for the last year though, so haven't unfortunately been on it much lately, um, but it's something that I'm really passionate about personally and try to use that option whenever I can and have been lucky enough to make housing decisions based on the access to transit. So, um, and then just kind of adding on, Alvin, Alvin already discussed kind of the, the projects in the plan, but more generally from Dr. Cog's perspective, um, we have our regional transportation plan, but we also have the Metro Vision plan, which is kind of like the overarching plan that all of those local governments came together and adopted, um, I think about four years ago. And one really important measure in there is reduction of greenhouse gases. And so we're working right now, I know the state is working on the climate action plan um, and the implementation of that and setting really, really aggressive targets about reducing greenhouse gases. So Dr. Cog is committed to, you know, we're going, we've already been tracking that and air quality is a huge, hugely important issue um, and really important regionally, of course. Um, but we are going to be, I think, really, really seeing some significant changes to the work that Dr. Cog does um, and to transportation in general based on that, the state's climate action plan. So um, kind of more to come on that one, but it's definitely very top of mind at the organization right now. Great, thanks. Does anybody else want to jump in on that with thoughts? Um, sure. I just wanted to address uh, road widening a little bit. Um, I, I wanted to give a shout out to Denver Streets Partnership. Um, the folks there have taught me a lot about um, uh, pedestrian and bike safety. Um, and, and when I think about road widening um, and sh on streets uh, specifically in really dense um, areas, it really gets down to that um, that safety and that vision zero of really how do we make sure that um, folks who are most vulnerable because they're on, um, you know, on the street, walking, biking, or rolling, you know, what does that mean for them? Um, I also, you know, recognize that um, 
the neighborhoods that we work with a lot, the global Illyria Swansea neighborhoods have been um, disproportionately affected by the I-70 widening. Um, and we have worked with um, both the community members, uh, um, various organizations, um, CDOT and a, a wide variety of nonprofits um, to uh, mitigate the impacts of that road widening, not only the future air quality um, outcomes of having more cars on that road, um, but also the multi-year construction project. What does that mean for noise, road closures? Um, you know, I, I regularly have to go through that neighborhood and, and I'm not part of the neighborhood, but um, I sympathize with all, all of the disruption of their lives um, through that. Uh, we work even, you know, just thinking about um, their houses, they can't open their, their windows because um, the construction, dirt, all that stuff gets in their houses. Um, but they don't have air air conditioning, so it gets hot in the in the winter or in the summer. Sorry, um, so com compounded a lot of environmental justice issues there. Um, I just realized that I forgot to say if I was a public transit rider. Um, so I moved to Denver without a car um, because I had never owned a car before. Um, I I uh, eventually succumbed to the uh, Metro Denver uh, priority of being car centric. So I will have to admit to that, um, but I do, um, Groundwork Denver provides um, our staff with eco passes and we um, don't require them to pay for it. Um, so, um, you know, we are trying to do our part to encourage uh, public transportation. We give all of our youth bikes, all of those kind of things. So. Great. Um, I'm going to take my panelists' um, priority here for a moment to uh, do two things. First of all, I'd like to um, just let people know what Good Business Colorado is and how we're approaching some of these issues. Good Business Colorado is a or business organization, a membership organization of about 350 and change businesses who um, prioritize the triple bottom line. So although we are attentive to prosperous economy and that's important and it's important that it reaches everyone, we also are concerned about um, equitable communities as well as a sustainable environment. Of course, there's so much crossover between those three areas, but in particular, um, we are looking um, at some of the uh, neighborhoods that are disproportionately impacted by industrial pollution, um, at the Suncor site, for example. Um, we are also looking at um, environmental issues in terms of the hopefully upcoming transportation bills that we hope to see drop in the legislature pretty soon. And then um, we're also looking at some affordable housing legislation, which brings me to my other prerogative that I'm gonna take and say, um, how do you all feel, think that affordable housing fits in with affordable transportation? And what do you think we can do to um, coordinate better um, in terms of our planning around both of those things together? Dr. Mackey, you are muted. It looks like you have something to say. I was sign, actually, <laughs> because that's a huge, huge meta question. Um, so I wasn't ready to speak it, but I will. Um, I'll just say that, um, again, I know I sound like, you know, a broken record, but, you know, in the name of supposed affordable housing, it's been at the expense of black and brown folks, right? Um, so that's my primary issue um, with the supposed, you know, affordable housing spots that have been popping up. They're not affordable, right? Um, they've pushed folks out. That's gentrification. Um, so I think that, again, we have to really be cognizant of even how we're labeling what affordable housing even is. Because um, different folks' positionalities in that conversation does matter. Um, because 
what's affordable to one is not realistically the target population that um, we're desiring to ensure gets access to that housing as well. Um, what I'll also say is quality is important as well. So um, bringing my, my uncle back into the space who has schizophrenia, um, the supposed like option through his housing voucher that he gets is a motel on Colfax that's run down, right? And so when we also think about, you know, affordable um, in those cases as well, there's a lack of quality, which I know was talked about as well with regards to the 15 and 15 L as well. So that's also something I wanna surface is um, affordable should also be in tandem with quality and it should be connected. And I'll stop there. Uh, Michael Mieta here from the Urban Land Conservancy. <clears throat> and uh, I'm gonna have to take a little bit of issue uh, with what uh, Dr. Mackey has said. Uh, I, I understand completely, uh, but uh, the affordable housing projects that ULC is involved with, for instance, just recently, the Walnut Street lofts, uh, high quality uh, apartments serving 30, 50 and 80% of, of, uh, of uh, uh, area medium income. Uh, I know it's difficult sometimes, uh, even 60 and 80% of area median income is a lot for some people. I understand that. What we, what we really have to do is uh, lower the level of uh, affordability and that means more resources. That means the state of Colorado, that means the city of Denver needs to put more money into each affordable housing project so we can uh, 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 you know, serve more 30% of area medium income, it's that simple. Uh, now, in terms of getting more affordable housing, uh, I think uh, RTD, uh, when possible, needs to make, uh, uh, make available uh, land around uh, the uh, uh, light rail or, or transit. Uh, I know that uh, ULC and, and other nonprofits are always trying to buy land, <clears throat> but we have to buy land that's reasonable or you can't make an affordable housing project pencil in. And that's one of the issues in the Denver area is the, the cost of land. But uh, that said, uh, right now, we have about five projects in the pipeline that are right within a stone's throw of, uh, of light rail, of, of transit stations. So uh, we, we have to keep working at it and more people have to get involved, more developers have to get involved. But uh, there's a way to make it work, but it's, it's, it's hard and it takes time, you know, one, one, one development takes three years, four years from the time of the idea to finally opening it up. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's a really tough question, but there are people trying to get it done, but uh, we need more resources, plain and simple. All right, thank you so much for your comments. I'm gonna um, transition to a closing uh, so we can find out how we can participate in the plan. Um, I would like to also um, ask the, our, uh, our folks from Dr. Cog how they will use the feedback and insights that we've shared here uh, to inform the plan moving forward. So uh, Lisa and Alan, if you could just address how people can participate and how you're going to loop back and let us know what happened with that, with that input. Absolutely. Thanks, Angelique. I'm going to show just I promise there were no more slides, but there's just one more slide um, just to kind of list it all out. Um, so we are currently in the draft review phase of the plan, which means it's out for public review. We've had a few public meetings um, last week and this week, including this one, um, where we've gotten to talk to a bunch of great people. Um, we also, because it's the during the pandemic, we've had to be a bit more creative about our engagement and create some more virtual options so that people can engage from the safety of their home. We developed this virtual open house that people can go to whenever they want to, whenever they have time, and they can really learn as much or as little about the plan as they want. They can dig into the full 180 pages and 19 appendices, or they can just read a couple paragraph summaries of the different like main topics. Um, we have some surveys and discussion boards. 
Uh, there's even an opportunity if people want to to uh, comment directly on the on the um, specific like pages or maps or uh, things in the plan. So there's lots of ways for people to engage that way. The link is there um, on this slide, and I think maybe Alvin will throw it in the chat so people can directly get to it. Um, we also have developed an interactive map. So there, part of the plan that we didn't talk about too much today is that there are a number of projects involved in the plan um, for the next 30 years. And so we've developed an interactive way that people can really zoom in and look at what's planned for their communities, the funding levels and timing and things like that. So uh, lots more that you can dig in there. It, the plan is just open for public comments. So you can also send me or Alvin an email. Um, at any point. Uh, and then our final step is that we will have a public hearing before the Dr. Cog Board of Directors on March 17th. So our Board of Directors is made up of the of representatives of all of those 58 member governments that I, Alvin mentioned at the beginning that make up Dr. Cog. So those are city council members and county commissioners that represent each of those local governments. And they're really the ones that make the decision on the plan. Um, so that public hearing is where they will hear from the public. We're going to create um, a summary of all the input that we've heard since the plan was released um, kind of in mid-February and all the different ways that we've heard it. And so the Dr. Cobb Board of Directors and our transportation committees will hear a summary of that. They will not take action until their um, April board meeting. And so that's when the actual action on the plan is expected to happen. Um, and then we are planning to send out, include that summary of engagement and what we heard from all of these, um, all of these different methods that we've been using back to everybody that engaged. So we'll be, we'll be in touch um, and we'll talk about how, how that affected the draft plan. So what changes were made between that kind of March and April period um, and ultimately what our board of directors adopted. So we are just so grateful um, for all of you being at this meeting. I know we're, we've still got more um, to talk about, but really appreciate everybody sitting in to talk about this really important topic and encourage you to, to learn more about the plan and continue to engage and provide more input on the actual plan. Alvin, do you, did I miss anything that you wanna add? Uh, it all sounded good. I think I would just add, like I had mentioned in the beginning of the panel, I don't know how many of y'all have been involved in our process before, but if it's our first time reaching out to you, I hope we can stay involved beyond just this plan. Uh, and we don't just hear hear from you or talk to you again in four years. So part of what we're hoping to achieve is also some, you hold us accountable to what we're showing and what we're investing in and what are our priorities. So we hope y'all stay with us beyond this plan and try to get involved in some of our other planning efforts and our other planning products that we do that aren't just our long range vision for transportation in the region. Thanks Alvin, yeah, that's a really great point. All right, I'll stop with the slides. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, very much. Oh, is the plan available in other languages besides English? Oh, that's a great question. So we have um, a kind of one page overview that's in Spanish and we have um, the executive summary is translated into Spanish, but that virtual open house is also, um, it has like Google Translate enabled so that it the whole site can be translated to into any language. Obviously that's not perfect translation, um, but we're hoping that um, that is helpful because you can read all the summaries and still participate in all of the surveys and discussion boards that way. Um, and we are happy if somebody um, uh, requests the full copy of the plan, we are happy to translate that and provide any assistance that is necessary. Great, thank you. Um, Frank made a good point uh, for the attendees. Uh, know how your city council members vote on these issues because especially with the local control, so many of these decisions, in particular the housing um, and the and you know any lo special local transportation are made at that city council level. And you know, your vote really counts <laughs> on that level. So it is very possible to get involved with, um, with that, that place where the rubber really meets the road for democracy and that's in, on your local city council. So I'm going to ask a last question here for our panelists, and that is, as we wrap up, um, please share what your vision is for 2050. What is your vision for 2050? And I'm going to ask you to do that in about a paragraph. We'll start at the top of the roster with Christian, as always. 2050, oof. Um, so my vision would be uh, 
the elimination of all fossil fuel uh, vehicles um, uh, and a mix of uh, you know mass transit or micro transit. Uh, um, I would like to see more um, greenscaping, uh, especially in neighborhoods where there are um, you know people of color or poor people. Um, and uh, I would like to see uh, more, um, uh, you know, may maybe maybe if I'm really out there, like maybe we'll just start teleporting places. You know, I don't know if there's any fossil fuel associated with that, but I would love that. So that's it. That would be fantastic. I love that. I'm a big um, Star Trek geek, so I particularly <laughs> particularly enjoy that, um, that vision. Janice, what's your vision? Yeah, um, so definitely like an eradication of the ways white supremacy, classism, all the inner isms, right, interlocking systems. Um, a vision where our finesse and dignity is not simply celebrated, but codified from policy to implementation um, to sustain and actualize social equity and just want to name right that social equity emphasizes actual change in public management um, and responsiveness to the needs of folks rather than simply making public organizations look good so that's my vision awesome cindy yeah i will echo christian and dr Mackey, and i just will um leave a few words. I don't have a whole paragraph. Um, my words are um, a just, sustainable, and community-led uh, community and region. Thank you. Sydney? Mine's uh, pithy as well. Um, my vision is resilient, well-resourced communities that are prepared for the implications of climate change and working to um, actively take care of each other and the planet. Um, and additionally, I'd really like to see um, corporations and industries that are very responsible for our um, environmental degradation truly held responsible and for such as well. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa and Alvin, what are your visions? I'm gonna think. I'm gonna think more about like the transportation system vision, and I think that by 2050, me personally, I've been talking to a lot of people over the last two years about their vision for the transportation system for 2050. We've definitely gotten a lot of like hover car jokes and things like that, and teleporting, and who knows where we're gonna be by 2050. If you think back to what the region was in 1990 compared to now, um, it's obviously uh, changed a lot. Um, maybe not a lot of great not all great decisions that have happened over those last 30 years. So I think that just moving forward, I, I really hope that um, we're making decisions that have included the voices of the people that those decisions impact. So I want to make sure that the 2050 that we see is really something that the people now and the people that will live here in the future, um, what they want, how they want to get around the Denver region. Um, and I want, want there to be conven convenient and affordable options for all the different modes of travel. So um, I hope that that's where our Denver region gets to. And I think that um, we've talked a lot about like the important link between land use and transportation and housing and all of those interconnected things. And um, I hope that we have solved those issues by 2050. And then I'll just add on, um, it will also just be a short response. But the transportation decisions that are being made by 2050 don't just mitigate harm uh, or mitigate the impacts. There don't have to be impacts to those communities or undoing some of the harm that's been caused over the last 30 years and that could occur for 2050. Excellent. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank our wonderful panelists for spending your valuable time with us. I wanna thank our attendees for spending their valuable time with us as well. Um, and I wanna let you know that we'll be following up with a thank you and instructions on how to um, provide feedback for the plan. 
that you can um, share with the with the folks that you are in contact with. I would imagine most of the folks on this call um, have some aspect of leadership in their various circles. So thank you everyone again for joining us today and um, have a great weekend as it's coming up. Thanks everybody. Bye everyone. Good job panelists. Bye, thank you. Thank you all. Bye. See you all.